Well, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Maybe some more folks will join us as we go. Uh, welcome to the webinar on biochar production potential. We're going to talk to Darren here out of the Utah State University. He's actually a CSU alumni, so thanks a lot for helping us out with this, Darren. We appreciate working with you on this workshop and in some of the other things we've done and look forward to seeing your photos and such. Go Aggies, go Rams. Yeah, right. Uh, hopefully we do a little better as we continue to move through the season here. So uh, Darren is uh, an ex assistant, excuse me, an extension assistant professor of forestry at Utah State. He's also the chair of the Utah Biomass Resources Group, and he's got a lot of expertise on some of these different projects they've been working on related to converting. Uh, well, we're going to talk about exactly what biochar is, but converting grass material, plants, and other such living materials into uh, biochar. And so we've done some really cool things over the last few years here. Actually, together we did some cool workshops last year, and we're going to have a video on our website about that. Um, but Darren's been doing a lot of really good things over the last several years. And so, um, Darren, that's a good introduction. I'll let you take it away. Okay. Thanks a lot, John. Sure appreciate it. How's that volume? Sounds oh, good. good. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Darren McAvoy. I represent the Utah Biomass Resources Group. Um, this slide here, I, I was realizing as we were chatting at the beginning, didn't really plan this, but uh, this shows uh, Logan down, down I, I presenting from Logan, Utah, um, uh, the northern part of Utah, about 20 miles from Idaho. Uh, this slide is looking up into Idaho and across the Cache Valley, and down in here is uh, where Logan is. Um, and, and that's where on Monday I uh, fell off my bike and I'll share with you once the, the full uh, glory of, of the left side of my face and for the rest of the time I uh, try to give you this uh, right side profile. It's not quite so beat up. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I represent the Utah Biomass Resources Group. These are our partners. Um, uh, partner a lot with Amaron Energy and the Forest Service, the BLM. Utah Department of Ag and Food, the Department of Natural Resources, others include Euclid Timber Frames, um, and more. So uh, biochar, uh, we're gonna talk about biochar and biochar potential today. Um, uh, what is biochar is a simple um, explanation or definition. Biochar is charcoal for agriculture. Um, it's similar to charcoal. It's uh, maybe cooked a little bit longer. Some of those, those uh, volatiles cooked off of it that you might leave on for charcoal. Um, and what we're left with is mostly carbon. Um, can be 70 to 90 some percent pure carbon. Um, um, and uh, biochar can be made from any organic material. Um, this is how it's made uh, with pyrolysis, and that is uh, roughly Latin for separation uh, by fire. Um, it's a thermal thermochemical decomposition of the wood. Um, it's not flaming combustion, but there is glowing combustion um, under very limited oxygen uh, conditions and uh, at temperatures of 400 to 600 degrees Celsius, roughly. Um, it does four things. It does a lot of things, but these are the main four things. Biochar absorbs nutrients and water. Um, it, uh, when we add it to soil, it changes soil structure. It increases the microbial activity and the, the ecosystem of microbes uh, in soil and increases uh, soil water holding capacity. So in states like Utah, where I'm from, that's a pretty important thing. We're the second driest state in the nation. Um, and we talk a lot about these days, or I do, um, about this potential value chain. If we, um, when we look at biochar singly, um, it may not, uh, necessarily hold its value uh, when when compared to other products um, but when we can consider that all four of these steps uh, are value added steps then it starts to make a lot more sense um, for one it reduces uh, wood waste and hazardous fuels and that's 
largely where I come at it from as a forester, an extension forester. Uh, for me, I've spent a good part of my career running through the woods this time of year, uh, lighting piles on fire. Sometimes those uh, slash piles would be as large as my house. And we just run day after day from pile to pile, let, trying to burn up as much material as we can um, post logging season. And it's a heck of a lot of waste um, and, and carbon into the atmosphere. And uh, there might be a better way of, of approaching things. Um, um, two, it absorbs nutrients and moisture. Um, we can use it to, uh, say, between a sewage uh, plant in a small town and the wetlands to soak up that phosphorus. And then we've added value to the biochar by soaking up that phosphorus and other nutrients. And we put it on our soil for number three, and it imp improves long-term soil productivity. And at the same time, when we put it in our soil, it's long-term carbon sequestration. It can last for tens, hundreds, or thousands of years in the soil. Very durable. When you biochar material, wood chips, very small wood chips, they come out looking like very small wood chips except black. Uh, it retains the same shape. Uh, it uh, shrinks a little bit and or significantly, but it, it looks like whatever you put in essentially just blackened. Um, bigger wood chips look like big black wood chips. Um, quick uh, one slide history of biochar. Uh, forgive the quality of this slide, it's, it's overused and just stolen off the internet. Um, and so this comes from the Amazon rainforest and the history is 20 years ago or so, a, uh, an agronomist uh, is flying over the Amazon that was recently logged um, for, for grazing land and supposedly it's a virgin rainforest and he sees these straight lines down in the, what was the, the forest soils the, and, um, and it didn't make any sense to him and he goes to in inspect these and finds these large embankments of dark earth soils, um, also known as terra preta soils, that are 2,500 years old and cover a significant portion of the Amazon basin. And in fact, the Amazon was heavily populated. Uh, there were large cities there and they supported themselves with, uh, not with the agriculture of, of the slash and burn and the poor rainforest uh, soil quality uh, that we see on the left. Uh, it rains so much, the water just leaches the nutrients right out of it. Um, what they did is they mixed their pot shards and their compost and their uh, their uh, uh, their waste and and they and and their charcoal and, and they burned it in these big embankments and buried them and and over time created what are now now known to be super soils or terra preta dark earth soils um, and the essential key to that we think is is biochar uh, is the charcoal component charcoal component of that. And here on the left, you see a, a typical rainforest soil profile from the Amazon and, the, and above the productivity. Um, and on the right, you see a, a, a terra preta soil, a, a biochar enhanced soil, and the productivity perhaps five times to eight times more than that on the left. And now it's worth five times to eight times uh, in real estate value. So this is something that these people's ancestors gave them thousands of years ago. And our knowledge of biochar could be looked at as a way to give a gift to our ancestors many generations into the future to amend our soils to make them more productive and to store, store carbon. And here's some history of uh, biochar uh, or charcoal production here in Utah. Um, and you'll see these all over the West and in the Inner Mountain West. I believe Colorado has some. Uh, these are just west of Evanston and have been refurbished. These are charcoal kilns. Um, and back in the day, uh, pioneer times, there were iron smelters, a big industry for iron smelting in, in Salt Lake City, and they needed the, the steady heat and the high temperature heat that charcoal produces. Plus, they knew that uh, wood was mostly air and water. You couldn't afford to haul it from the Uinta Mountains clear over to uh, Salt Lake City. So they decided to, to build these kilns here near Evanston and process the wood closer to where it comes from. And uh, in the plaque that describes this site, they talk about pyrolysis. It's pyrolysis. It's essentially the same process that we use today. A big part of my approach is dealing with hazardous fuels like we have here. This is a pinion juniper woodland in the foreground pinion, more juniper here in the background. You can see some of these junipers are, when you get into this stand, they're actually 
almost ancient. They're quite old. And so this is a persistent stand that we want to protect. And we want to maybe cut some of these expanded stands around it uh, to protect the persistent stand. Um, and so pinyon juniper has been shown to have expanded across the Intermountain West by at least three times over since uh, settlement, um, European settlement, partly because of uh, we've stopped uh, wildland fires and partly because of grazing animals they choose the grasses and that allows the woody uh, vegetation to keep growing and it changes the balance of things right now this is a, a hazardous situation for for firefighters to enter into this is a picture of uh, that pinyon juniper resource across the intermountain west including colorado and um uh, it's 50 million acres and growing um, in this region and if you drew a bigger great big circle around the west including you know the loose interpretation of the west including texas and others uh, I've, I've seen estimates upwards of 100 million acres of, of this material and it, in utah it tends to be at, at about six tons per acre it's really spread out um, so again needing to densify it uh, closer to where we cut it closer to the stump uh, is part of the mission that that we're on here um, and of course, beetle kill. I don't have to tell Colorado residents about beetle kill. This is in Utah and the Uinta Mountains. Um, and uh, by some descriptions, you might say we have too much above ground carbon on, in this forest system. And, and there's ways, there's things that I think that we can do, do about it. Um, and of course, the concern is, is wildland fire. Um, I think if we make biochar in controlled situations with some of this fuel, it will help uh, uh, reduce wildland fire hazard and make uh, things safer for firefighters. Um, not too far down the hill from the Uintas, out in the Vernal Basin, uh, close to Colorado. We're probably about five miles from the Colorado border here, um, where this picture was taken, an abandoned well pad, uh, oil and gas pad on BLM land in the Vernal Basin. Um, and the soil is, is quite white uh, and obviously non-productive. It's a tough desert soil with only 10 inches of rain a year. Um, and part of the reason soil is, is white is because it doesn't have very much carbon in it. It lacks carbon and these, these mining restoration, these mining lands that need restoration can can benefit by an addition of carbon uh, to their soils and so can farmlands and so I see we talked about a minute ago I, I mentioned that there's too much above ground carbon uh, in our PJ lands or pinyon juniper woodlands or cedar woodlands um, and uh, our upland conifer forests our, our beetle kill forests and uh, not enough carbon in, in, in these soils so I see biochar as a way to uh, balance that out we can add biochar to our soil and that carbon uh, will be stored uh, long term and, and improve the soil productivity so to get started down the road towards uh, biochar, we as a biomass group got started with uh, a gasifier. The process is called gasification. Um, where we cook the wood at, at very high temperatures, um, upwards of 700 degrees Celsius, 800 degrees Celsius. And this relatively simple GEC uh, gas fire exchange kit um, uh, that we purchased and we ran, uh, and so it turns, we put a barrel full of wood chips on and um, it turns it into, a, a, we run it through a, a a propane generator, we clean up the gas, we run it through a generator and, and make enough electricity for two homes or in one case, uh, uh, one uh, country rock band. We had uh, Utah's first wood-fired concert uh, with the, dr the Dragon Wagon machine. And it was a lot of fun, but it wasn't all that practical to produce remote power. And as we were working on this machine, um, we were getting uh, help and in, in, in creating a partnership with a company called Amaron Energy. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about for the next few slides is in relation to our partnership with Amaron Energy. Um, this is a machine, as we were working on that gasifier, in the other corner of the shop was this machine. It's a pyrolysis machine. And so this cooks the wood uh, in the absence of oxygen or very low, limited amount of oxygen and thermally decomposes it into these three products, into biochar, a bio oil, and a, a syngas. The syngas is what we were making with the, the gasifier. Um, and but and this is great. So we started to uh, 
experiment with it with all kinds of different uh, woody feedstocks and found that it was pretty uh, useful, pretty robust. We could put in all kinds of wood chips and it would uh, effectively pyrolyze this material. Um, but the next challenge was to, to make it mobile, to, uh, to get it closer to the landing, to the, to the stump where we're cutting this material. And so we put it inside of this blue 20-foot uh, storage container. Uh, a friend of mine likes to joke that uh, all pyro, all biomass machines are mysterious things inside of blue trailers, uh, old storage containers. But um, um, so this is in Bingen, Washington, where the Washington Department of Natural Resources invited uh, teams from around the West to have a mobile pyrolysis cook-off, if you will, um, sort of a competition who can make uh, the highest quality biochar and bio oil in a, in a certain amount of time. And uh, Amaron Energy uh, won that competition and garnered another uh, $30,000 uh, grant to go back to uh, Clee Ellen, Washington a few months later for another demonstration. In the meantime, we got a grant to scale that technology up. This is the heart of the new reactor. Um, we got a Sun Grant from the US Department of Transportation. My former partner, Dallas Hanks, was critical in making that happen. He has since passed away, uh, but he got us started down this road. And um, so this is the heart of the reactor. It's a 24 inch diameter tube, whereas the other reactor was just a seven inch diameter tube. That smaller one could handle perhaps a thousand pounds of day, per day of input. And this newer, newer machine, this 24 inch diameter tube, it's 15 foot long, um, again, housed in this uh, uh, super insulated, uh, and, and heated environment and can per, and can handle up to 20 tons per day of input. So uh, a loaded log truck is about 25 tons, so approaching that amount per day. And that tube is uh, mounted inside of this machine. This is Jeff Caldwell, hard at work uh, uh, from Amaron Energy. And so that tube is inside of there and these are gas uh, exchanges that that with heaters down in the bottom and it's super insulated so the tube is constantly turning it's a rotary pyrolysis kiln and over about 10 minutes time uh, it's at a one degree angle that tube inside of here and the, the, the wood chips move through it and turn into those three products it's all very controlled each station along the way you can add or reduce the temperature. Um, we can make very precise biochars with this approach. We'd like to get to a world where someday we start with a soil problem and we reverse engineer a biochar to fix that problem. We're not quite there yet, but that's kind of the, the, the direction that, that the industry is moving. And so here is the mobile pyrolysis machine, again, in the mysterious uh, blue container, this time a 40-foot container. So that machine is inside of uh, this container and uh, here on a demonstration in Nevada that uh, lasted for more than 40 days um, and out in the Pinion Juniper resource. Uh, you can see my shadow here standing on the mountain of feedstock that, that we were aimed at, uh, at, at processing. This is the input. So we fill this with a tractor, uh, it climbs up in here, the biochar or the, the, the raw wood chips, excuse me, drop down in, work their way through the machine, biochar comes out, bio oil comes out, and bio gas comes out. And so if we set up this system, uh, more close to a sawmill or uh, some place where we could use this process heat close to a chicken uh, uh, poultry uh, facility or that sort of thing. This, this process heat could be utilized along the way and electricity could be made in addition to biochar and bio oil. So since I'm talking about Colorado, I'd include this slide of our, uh, this is a back to the smaller machine. We did a demonstration in Snowmass, Colorado um, for the Colorado Wildland Fire Conference. I think this was in 2015 um, and we've been to Colorado a few times. John uh, Rizza, our host here, kindly had us back this last winter and we did uh, demonstrations in, um, in the Grand Junction area and rifle area and uh, they were pretty successful. We had a lot of interested folks so momentum is slowly gaining. 
and the feedstocks that we put into it. Um, as I mentioned, this machine is quite robust, can handle a wide variety of feedstocks. I think we've done 23 different kinds. Um, lots of, uh, this is pinion juniper feedstock, lots of that, other conifer feedstock, upland conifer, aspen, dug fir, uh, kind of you name it in that arena. Um, uh, on this end, we have Phragmites, um, uh, an invasive swamp reed. That's what this picture is of uh, Phragmites, this background picture. Uh, it's taken over significant portions of the Great Salt Lake, and, uh, and this is a way to use it. Um, so this is Phragmites we made biochar from. And this is very unusual. Um, it was just a couple of weeks ago. This is uh, fabric waste from New York City where uh, there's more than, there's hundreds of factories in New York that uh, waste up to 30% of their fabric. And so people from there have been in touch. Uh, there's a, a company called Thread Cycle that's interested in, in reducing that waste amount. And so we're working with this company in New York City on the idea of placing one of these pyrolysis machines in the basement of a, of a factory in Manhattan. Uh, we're also, yeah, okay, that's enough. I could go on and on. Uh, here are the thread cycle gals, Chloe and Angela. And you can see this, uh, they, I think this is funny, uh, their boxes that the, this is the raw material that they ship to us. This is Dacron. Um, we also uh, pyrolyzed uh, cotton and rayon with them. So just a couple of weeks ago is a uh, uh, interesting uh, sort of side project and I like that uh, this box this photo captured the the Manhattan mini storage uh, box there um, here we have a photo of uh, Russian olive and another invasive tree taken over large parts of uh, wetlands bottom lands across the west and uh, this is on the curlew national grasslands just north of us here over the idaho border where we are making biochar out of russian olive in cooperation with amaran energy and the uh, caribou targi national forest and working on a research project turns out this curlew grassland is critical uh mating habitat for monarch butterflies from Mexico. Pretty surprising. And um, so we're planting islands of milkweed and other forbs and plants that are beneficial to the butterflies out in a restoration project. They're trying to uh, use biochar to grow better uh, milkweed and pollen for butterflies. So from fabrics in New York City to butterflies in Idaho, it's kind of a fun, fun project to be working on. But it does have its challenges. Um, I want to go through a couple of these. Um, one of them is just is, is feedstock preparation. Uh, we ask for chips, you know, maybe to be an inch or smaller, and we get pieces larger than our arm sometimes. And in some cases, uh, we've had to pay more for the chipping of the material than uh, was paid for the pyrolysis of the material. So that's a challenge that we need to work around. And got some ideas on that. When we're working in these remote locations such as Nevada, um, and we ask for chips that are inch less and we get chunks of wood like this one, uh, it tends to break up the machinery. This is a rotary um, a valve piece that uh, busted up because of that piece of wood. Um, and uh, we're 200 miles from Salt Lake City for another piece. So uh, it becomes pretty expensive. Um, uh, this is a biochar coming up out of the machine and into a, a super sack, a bulk sack. And notice this spot right here. This is the quenching station. This is a close up on that. This is something we added later. You got to turn the fire off at the end. Otherwise, it can burn up super sacks. Or we've given early in our, our tenure learning about this, uh, some of the first biochar we made at a demonstration, we gave somebody a bucket of, and they're driving home with it. And, uh, and it was in the back of their pickup. And next thing they know, they got, they got flames coming out of the back of their truck as they were driving home. So we've had, we've had some really fun, exciting times. Um, another challenge that we did not foresee when we started down this road in, in 2010, um, at that time, uh, petroleum was approaching $100 a barrel. And so our, our oil, this is our oil here um, that's, that's being stored, uh, had some value. It could be mixed and used as a bunker fuel. Um, but since petroleum dropped to less than $30 a barrel, um, our oil 
lost all of its value, um, which which was hard because it was helping to um, uh, break even on the on the operation. And so they added Amaron, put together this uh, incinerator so that the oil could be uh, just gotten rid of because out in the middle of the Nevada desert, it became a bit of a almost a liability. It was what it cost us to, uh, money to have it uh, transported. It it can uh, be refined into uh, higher value products. It's like a crude, a caustic crude oil. With the biochar, we can make very precise biochars with this approach. And, um, and we can use this approach to reduce wildland fuels. And, may, and there's lots of advantages to this very uh, uh, precise approach to biochar making. I wanted to mention briefly what torrefied wood is. Torrified wood is uh, similar to biochar. It's uh, browned instead of blacked. Uh, you can see here some raw torrified, and this is a block of it. And uh, Amaron and another company, AEG Coal Switch, are making a similar product with a different process. Um, are working with Pacific Ore and Rocky Mountain Power to replace 10% of the coal at two Utah power plants using this material. We're working up towards uh, built, uh, building a stockpile of uh, many hundreds of tons of this material for a one day test at the Hunter Power Plant. That's coming up. So shifting gears here a little bit to uh, what my uh, Nevada partner calls uh, caveman biochar. Um, these are flame cap kilns. It's a very simple approach to making biochar that anybody can do in their backyard um, or out in the woods or, or anywhere where you have excess fuels. Um, uh, these kilns come from Oregon. They're also called Oregon kilns, or I hear them called box kilns. It's just a metal box, uh, five foot by five foot, two foot high. Uh, it's labor intensive. Um, so I hosted, uh, this is Kelpie Wilson from Wilson Biochar Associates, Cave Junction, Oregon. She brought a, this trailer down with four of these kilns and some windscreens and and I hosted a workshop with USU Extension, a uh, grant from USU Extension. Um, this was in May in, in Draper, Utah, just south of Salt Lake City, May of this year, 2017. And uh, 60 people came. It was a little bit unique uh, crowd in that uh, it was a, a good mix of foresters and arborists and um, um, fuels reduction folks and, and, uh, and city managers. So uh, in, in the extension world, that's known as a diverse audience. So that, that was pretty cool. Um, and Kelpie taught us that day how to, how to make biochar with these simple kilns. And she brought four of, their, four of those kilns with her and left them, uh, purchased them. Uh, so they're, they're ours and in, in use here in Utah. And here's that same day. So we load the kiln up with uh, this material, bigger logs on the bottom and smaller on top. And we top light it. And part of the idea is that uh, it creates a flame across the top that uh, that no oxygen can get down in. So the only oxygen comes along the edge. And so that's how we limit the oxygen into the process. Um, and uh, uh, these are windscreens. It was a, quite a windy day. So we added windscreens to it. We don't often use those, um, but occasionally they're required. And here's looking down into the kiln as, as it's going. We keep, after, at this point, we might add some more wood uh, until we fill it up. And, to, and let it burn down to it looks about like this. And if you let it keep going, you would just have ash, like we have a layer of ash on top, but mostly this is just coals. And so, but the key part here is to quench it, uh, to add perhaps 80 gallons of water to it, uh, put that fire out, stir it up, um, and then we have biochar uh, that can be used uh, as a soil uh, amendment, We're ready to go. Um, sometimes we'll uh, pour it out on the ground. At this point, it's quite friable, quite uh, brittle, so we can uh, just drive over it with a pickup or something to bust it up to make it better for horticulture or agricultural purposes. And we took those kilns uh, after that demonstration and started using them uh, near Price, Utah, uh, near Soldier Summit. Um, and uh, this is a picture of just as I pulled onto the site that day where they were used. I was so pleased to see flames, controlled flames going on out in the woods with, uh, in the middle of the forest safely. Um, there's a, some new research that shows that uh, just the charcoal addition of 
uh, the wildland fires um, is a benefit to forest health. And here's another, here's a safer way without the, the, the bother of wildland fire, although wildland fire is an important part of our ecology. Um, it can be a little bothersome. Uh, and uh, here, here's a way to sort of replace a little bit of that. These are my partners at Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands on this grant, Natalie Conlon from Moab and P.J. Abraham from uh, Huber City on a, in a kiln that, that's in the middle of, uh, of a cook. And after it burned down, some of the flames died down, added a bunch of water. This is the quenching phase, stirring it up. And in this project, most of the biochar were spreading back out on the forest soil after we've extinguished it. Um, and uh, fire crews are doing this this work, and and it was a thinning of aspen and and uh, dug fir, so it was it was waste wood that needed to be it was hazardous fuels needed to be dealt with, and so now we have this biochar in the soil, and the theory is that. Uh, if it's going to increase water holding capacity, uh, it's going to make the trees that are remaining more resistant to insects and diseases and to droughts and thereby more fire resistant. So we've reduced the fuels, made it made the forest more resilient that way and made it more resilient with the addition of biochar. And here's some, this is what it looks like for the char on the ground. Over time, this will work down into the soil, especially the smaller pieces. And with the addition of cattle that graze this site uh, will beat it down into the ground pretty successfully over time. And I, the intention is that people run with this idea. You don't need that. Oregon kiln, you can use about any vessel that you have. My friend is a firefighter here in town and uh, he, this is his biochar maker in the backyard, just his, his little fire pit. Um, I gave a demonstration on biochar production at the Boulder, Utah, not Boulder, Colorado, but Boulder, Utah Harvest Festival um, here just a, a month or so ago. Um, and I asked them what they had available. Um, so, because the kilns were being used up there in Soldier Summit, and they had this cattle trough available. And so that worked great. We made biochar with that. And I want you to note that it's right next to these wood panels and garden and home. We had a fire, you know, we had a hose there. Uh, we were taking good precautions. And we had sprinklers going on the field across the, the road next to here. But uh, this is uh, something we can do right in the wildland urban interface and next to homes. This is my partner since retired, Dusty Moeller. From, uh, uh, we were in Nevada here, and this is one of the Nevada kilns. I mentioned earlier that it's uh, uh, these uh, convict labor in Nevada on, with the Nevada Division of Forestry. Um, Eric Rousseau is in charge of that project, and the work out in Pinion Juniper using kilns like this and reducing hazardous fuels. And the fun part of this is that when the crews are a little bored and the ground is flat enough. They take one of these two these hoops off and they roll it up, put it on its side, and, and walk through it like a hamster wheel to move it around the ground. It's so easy, even a baby can do it. Um, now this is called a tea lud, a, a top lit updraft, uh, very common old school biochar production uh, backyard approach. And I this is uh, just a picture of some. Uh, pipes at the we have a, a water laboratory here on campus and this is uh, this is their bone yard and I, I, I walk my dog through here sometimes and dream about turning these these vessels into biochar kilns uh, I haven't got permission yet but I'll, I'll work on that so the point being that you can use just about anything that's available in my interest, I meant to say there that uh, my interest is in working with some people to scale this up. I made uh, contact with a potential strong uh, industrial partner uh, last week, and uh, we're talking about uh, using a much bigger box and a track hoe to do the same approach and, and scale it up so we can really reduce fuels in, in a large uh, on a large scale. And so how available is biochar right now? This is in Salt Lake City. Um, this is on Amaron Energy's landing. So all these super sacks are all full of biochar. So that these can be purchased in Utah, but it's, it's not like you can just go to your local store and, and buy it quite yet. 
Um, this is uh, this is back to the photo, Jonah Levine from Confluence Energy in Kremlin, Colorado. And then this is in Nevada at a, another demonstration back in 2012. Uh, right now, Jonah is uh, based out of Confluence and, and uh, has biochar available there. And I understand there's uh, one or two other biochar production outfits there in Colorado. So in some ways, you guys are a little bit ahead of us. And you can off of Amazon or some stores, you can buy a biochar amended compost. And this is really the direction a lot of uh, folks are going in the industry, trying to mix it with a compost um, because it, uh, it'll it absorb all those nutrients from that compost and, and make it more, more productive. A few words on uh, our application trial tests of biochar in Utah. This is a, a drilling pad, a abandoned well pad from oil and gas. And you guys know all about that in, in Colorado. Most of these are two and a half acres and there's uh, tens of thousands of them now uh, dotting the Western landscape. And many of them are being uh, reclaimed successfully, but some are not. This is a failed reclamation project. Just came back into cheatgrass and halogeton and undesirable weeds. So they turned it over to us in the Utah Biomass Resources Group. I'm working with uh, uh, Colorado resident from Silverton, um, Chris Peltz. Sorry to say he's leaving Colorado now, but moving to Wyoming. But anyway, here's Chris down here. And, um, and so we uh, put a bunch of trials of, of biochar um, applications on this site. And this is the same site, gridded out. Some we use their typical mining approaches, the mining companies' approaches, like adding gypsum and straw and other things. NPK is fertilizer. I have to say, one of the results of this work is that uh, this company, uh, QEP Energy, stopped using NPK commercial fertilizer because they found this other approach was, was more effective. So before we got going, we did a greenhouse study. This is uh, soil from that site um, in a greenhouse with biochar in this one and none in this one. And, and the biochar moved down through the soil and allowed the water to move down through the soil profile. We had much more productive above ground uh, biomass um, and, and not much going on in, in the typical uh, Uinta soil. This is a site on the ground. Um, it's a tough site. Uh, not so easy. And so we had started with very crude biochar application methods. So you can see we got better over time. This is Chris uh, uh, monitoring the site. Um, what we're finding is we have the best results where biochar is available and, and visible on the surface. And this is how we've stepped up our game a little bit. Uh, instead of just hanging a super sack from a from a track from a, a forklift, we're we're able to use this lime spreader now to to spread biochar on a bigger scale. This is uh, an old uh, settling pond that that uh, has been abandoned, and they turned it over to us to use biochar. See if we can use biochar to uh, to better uh, reclaim the site. And this is Confluence Energy Biochar on this side, purely black. This is another product. It's what we're calling a high co compost uh, or high carbon fertilizer. This is from uh, Mancus, Colorado, from the Excelsior mill there. Uh, they just, it's a crude biochar. They're not really selling it as biochar, but they had a large legacy pile of aspen and other material catch on fire and they, uh, to deal with the fire, they buried it and, and, and it, as a result made a very crude biochar. And it's cheap and uh, we're finding some of our best results with this, this type of product, uh, at least bang for the buck. Here's a re uh, picture of that results and where we use that mixed material is out in here, uh, where we have in a seed drill uh, was used here. Uh, these are more sacks of biochar on the landing. Um, so we're having pretty good success on this site. And one last study I wanted to mention with application uh, in the Wasatch Front, uh, working with UX, USU Extension Partners, Commercial Vegetable Farms, and the USU Botanical Center on uh, biochar application for uh, growing better tomatoes and more productive for melons. Uh, we're still uh, monitoring for the results of that. For more information, uh, here's my website, our uh, biomass group website. There's lots of information there. I've written a lot of articles about this uh, in my newsletter, the Utah Forest 
Forest News, uh, which is available there. And I've done a few other webinars and uh, with partners um, uh, similar to this one um, that might offer a little different perspective. Um, and they're available at this link here. And here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Always uh, interested in comparing notes with other biocharists. Thank you very much. Good job, Darren. That's some awesome information. Every time I listen to you speak, I learn a little more about some of the things that are going on with biochar. And, um, we're actually looking at seeing what we can do here on the West Slope to continue some of that work that we did together last year. So hopefully folks will stay tuned for some opportunities there. Um, I do have a, uh, both go ahead and if you have any questions for Darren on the bottom of the screen, there's a pop-up little chat box. You can type it into the chat. And in the meantime, if you would please indicate how much you learned during today's webinar, that would be uh, very helpful for us. So that webinar poll has just been pulled up there and you can, uh, you can click on there. Um, looks like we had some great info there. And Darren's info will come out on the um, on the email listserv so that if you need to uh, get a hold of him or you're obviously welcome to uh, to do that as well. And so here is that uh, here's that webinar, um, excuse me, poll on the webinar um, that you can vote on. Um, hopefully there's some good opportunities to continue to work together with some of the different folks doing this stuff. I think there's some really neat opportunities to utilize this as a an agricultural resource. Uh, we have a lot of material like you discussed here in Colorado that we need to figure out a way to do it. Um, so Darren, it looks like one of the questions is uh, how much oil and gas and oil is produced per ton of fuel is what this one question is asking. Okay, uh, I think I understand the question and um, for a ton of input of uh, feedstock that we put into the machine, um, 50 and this is with Amaron Energy's machine uh, machine in particular 50% comes out as bio oil 25% give or take comes out as biochar and about 25% comes out as uh, syn gas um, so if you put it in a ton you get a half a ton of bio oil uh, a uh, quarter ton of biochar and a quarter ton theoretically, of this gas material. With the simple kilns, um, ratio is eight to one. We can reduce the amount of fuel um, volume uh, from branches uh, eight times down, down to uh, biochar chips. Yeah, and I recall from when we ran the uh, smaller machine here on our demonstration projects that um, those smaller chips that were in that size range that you discussed, I think that was about an inch, seemed to really um, pyrolyze much better. You have all that surface area. There's some really neat pictures online with uh, electron microscopes that show all the surface area where um, you're increasing that surface area of the organic matter that you're putting down on the ground. So I think, um, keeping an eye on using smaller materials seems to be a really good thing. And I'm guessing that's what you guys are seeing even in the homemade type ones. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the same for application. I'm working on a project, a grant uh, proposal right now to apply it to an existing alfalfa field under a, a pivot, uh, irrigation pivot. And the point is to see if we can use less water and, uh, and in the research that I'm doing, talking to partners about it, I'm finding that one of the keys to that is to have real small piece size in your final biochar. So, because so, uh, the stand of alfalfa is already existing, you can't uh, turn it into the soil per se. It's got to be a topical application. So, small pieces is important there, and also uh, your productivity goes up considerably when your when your pieces are small. So another question we have here from Kiefer is, uh, can construction materials with paint and other chemicals become, um, chemical products, excuse me, become fuel? Or are there difficulties in separating that? Yeah, there could be difficulties. We haven't really experimented with that. Um, we have used a lot of, uh, not construction waste, but urban wood waste, tree branches and that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm 
pretty positive the machine could handle uh, the the material if it had paint and other material other mixed in things with it we would need to do some research on what kind of emissions um, and have to figure out uh, you'd have to look at the biochar uh, pretty closely at the end and decide carefully how you were going to apply it because if it retained any of those nasty things you certainly wouldn't want to put it on agricultural lands um, in some cases uh, maybe not in that particular case but other biochars that are, weren't made from maybe the most pure sources could be used more for for just growing trees or horticultural purposes yeah and that's uh, the next part of this lesson talks about that um, quality or quality as the fuel burns it seems like when they were using the actual pyrolysis machine, I don't recall any really smoke or anything coming out of the stack, but whereas you're using that DIY kind of situation, uh, that might be a little more of a concern to address. And I think what you put in is what you get out. So if you put clean materials in, you'll get a clean, good burn. And if it's a quality uh, box that's, that's burning appropriately is my guess. So. My, you know, I would assume that anything we put in there is going to potentially come off when we're burning. So let's make sure we're using probably more clean and less hazardous materials. I agree with that. Um, and additionally, John, um, I, it's the next steps for me in my research. One thing in, in my, my work, my application is one thing to scale it up, as I mentioned, to, to bigger machinery, um, the, the simple approach, but also to, uh, if I can get the funding to have the emissions tested, the, there's a fire lab Forest Service has in Missoula. And they've already done uh, burn open piles in, uh, um, in, in this con controlled situation so they have sort of a baseline we know how much emissions come from open piles and I, I'm, I'm very confident that in these kilns it'll be much much cleaner um, anecdotally I've got evidence of that just our air quality person uh, that's associated with prescribed burning a multi-agency person was at has been to a couple of my demonstrations this way and he said he confirmed uh, what my thought is um, uh, that most of the smoke is actually burned up with that flame all the smoke is coming up through those flames that flame cap design and it's it's, it's getting burned up so uh, the emissions I think are, are much less but the research still needs to be done on that yeah I think that's a great theory and would love to see some more involvement with that um, we get a lot of questions from individuals who are looking to you know implement these on their orchards or other places on their own properties and so Having some of this information for those folks and referring them to each other to, to talk about these ideas. Um, there's definitely some neat things that people are thinking of and I think we can continue to learn. Um, another question here is what is the BTU value of biochar and can it be used as a higher temperature fuel? Yes, um, it's very similar to charcoal. We could modify the process. Uh, we would, we might, uh, like in the simple kilns, we might quench the fire a little sooner, leave some of the volatiles on there that we wouldn't want for biochar to make more of a charcoal. In fact, uh, on my way here, maybe this question came from Steve. I had a conversation with a gentleman, I think from Ohio, who was interested in uh, this biochar product to fire uh, pottery kilns. Um, and I don't have any research on it, but it's, it's very close to charcoal. I, it seems like it would work pretty well. So yeah, we're working on that. Um, I think we know the answer to this, but let's just clarify it. Uh, could the material be burned in pits and then after the biochar is produced, that soil and biochar be returned and pressed into, processed into the soil, I'm guessing is what they're asking? Yeah, absolutely. It can be done in pits, any container like that. It's going to limit oxygen. In fact, back, uh, back in the day when I was a consulting forester out of northern Idaho, um, for especially clean logging jobs, one of my favorite results uh, uh, in harvesting and dealing with the slash uh, would be winter logging on top of snow uh, while you're 
protecting the ground. And uh, then in that situation, I've had instances where we just dug a big trench next to the landing and, and got a fire going in there and just all winter long, essentially for, for months, push slash the, the debris onto the, on, into that pit. And it just kept absorbing it and absorbing it. And, and we were done, we just buried the whole thing. So if I could find where that pit is <laughs> and all those pits in, in Northern Idaho, I'd have these biochar stashes. I guess, I guess we have little Terra Preta things going up there right now in some ways, uh, unintentional. Um, but yeah, that method can certainly be used. One of the challenges would be just recovering the biochar out of the pit. Assume you'd, it, it'd be such a concentration, you'd it'd probably be more effective to spread it around. But if you got a, a tractor to dig a pit, you got a tractor to spread the char. So it shouldn't be that big of a problem. Yeah, and I think for some of the folks uh, who are growing for orchards and things, this is a really neat thing. We talked about the emissions and there's more to look at, but the process by which we're burning in the absence of oxygen really produces a lot less emissions. So this can really be something that's good as a little more pressure comes on these agricultural communities to adjust those um, prescribed and pile burning type activities. So We've been working peripherally, at least discussing with the uh, orchard growers here in Utah, the idea of using uh, cherry pits. I'm not really sure if Colorado has a cherry industry. A little bit. A little bit. Uh, we have a significant one here and, uh, and a, a big waste product is the chip, is the pits. And, uh, and any pits I think would work. It's, it's a nice piece size. I think it'd be easy to pyrolyze. Um, uh, and, and potentially it could be set up where, uh, the process heat was used in the, in processing the cherries, if, if it was that sort of an outfit. Neat. Uh, another question, uh, and you went over this a little bit was, uh, is biochar available as a commodity? I think we saw that it's pretty small scale. And, um, we did talk to the guy out of, uh, down in the Southwest portion of the state about that, Excelsior products there. Uh, and then what is the typical price per yard for both purchasing and selling? Have you seen? Um, it's changing over time. Um, I, I don't know if I'm going to have the best numbers, but in the range of a couple of hundred dollars a yard, I've seen it as low as maybe $140 a yard, $180 a yard, that range. Um, Five years ago, we were talking closer to a thousand dollars a yard. So, if you look at that trajectory, uh, it's certainly going to get cheaper as more people get into it and start making their own. Um, it presents another sort of uh, interesting issue we have in the field. Uh, a lot of times we talk about biochar in tons, and other times by weight, and other times we talk about by volume. Uh, and we talk about adding 10 tons per acre, um, for example, is a typical application rate. Um, but how much volume is that? Um, it can be quite variable, especially if you just quenched your char, it's carrying a lot of water, so it's gonna be heavy. So uh, still working out some of those variables. Really interesting. I think uh, the last question we'll wrap it up here with is, um, um, just touch a little bit more on the Torify wood. You mentioned it real briefly and what the fuel value of that is. And obviously we're going to see more coming out of the project you guys are working on. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. In some ways that has the greatest potential to use the highest volume of hazardous wood. Um, uh, my understanding is that it burns about like coal. It's very similar to coal. We've done uh, several tests at a scaled down power plant with our partners at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. They have a, a combustion facility there where they have a scaled down guts of all different kinds of power plants so we can run tests uh, at reasonable costs and without interrupting power production there. And one of the big questions that way uh, wasn't so much about the BTU value, but how it would crush and how it would feed and mix with the coal. And uh, with uh, the right approaches we found um, at that facility that uh, it can mix quite well with the coal and, and not, not require much for, for upgrade uh, for the facility. And part of the motivation there, as I understand it, um, 
Um, now, Utah does not have a, a, a clean power requirement, so I didn't think we'd have much chance of, of making this happen in Utah, but it come to find out that, uh, in particular, the Bonanza power plant near the Colorado border, border in uh, the Uinta Basin, they, um, when they were commissioned by the EPA, they were told they could burn X number million tons of coal whatever that number is and um and that's their life that period that's as long as they can run and so that's a true incentive if we can use wood to stretch out the life of that that plant which is relatively young it's still less than 20 it's only 10 years old now and if they keep using coal at the current rate they're gonna have to shut down in 10 years and so if we can replace some of that coal with this torrified wood product, perhaps that plant can last for another 10 years. Um, so uh, just working on those ideas. That's awesome, Darren. I think that's a, a good segue for now, and I really appreciate your time. Um, Thank you, John. Appreciate really, you hosting it. Yeah, glad, glad to have you, and look forward to seeing what we can do some more. Um, I'm John Rizzo with the Small Acreage Management Program here at CSU. And uh, I want to thank Darren McAvoy at Utah State University and uh, look forward to chatting you guys some more. Keep an eye on our website for additional resources and information. And in the meantime, have a great winter.